about the the structure of the class, what we are going to, look, to be if looking for to be able to understand how economies work at the, ma at the aggregate level. Uh, uh, we understand that for um, in, as a way of understanding how what change is happening in the economy over time. Uh, in the short run, we typically are going to focus on demand. It's the demand side that de de determines the way the, the economy behaves in the short run, whereas in the long run, we have to bring in supply side uh, factors, production, technology, institutions. So in this segment, we're going to focus on the demand side. And uh, this is uh, the beginning of trying to uh, determine the conditions for equilibrium in the, in the entire economy. The best way to think about equilibrium in the entire economy is by looking at, first of all, looking at equilibrium in different markets. We have the good market, the goods market, the uh, money market or financial market, and then the labor market. In the short run, we're going to focus on the good market, the goods market, and the financial market. In, in terms of the financial markets, we know that there are different uh, financial instruments there is money, there is non-monetary financial assets, bonds, and so on. We will, we will see how we can actually determine equilibrium in the financial market by only looking at the money market. But for now, let's, let's look at the goods market. Here, what we are interested in is to look at how output, which is goods and services produced, serves to meet the needs of the economic agents. These are households, uh, firms, and the government. So for households, the needs are mainly consumption needs. For firms, it's investment needs. For the government, is financing public expenditures. So um, the demand side is going to be composed of consumption by households, investment by firms, and expenditures by the government. This is within the context of, of, a, of a closed economy when we are not looking at trade. When we open to look at trade, then we look at exports by the US and imports by the US from other, from, uh, from other countries. So to summarize, um, demand at the national level, or what we call aggregate demand, is composed of consumption, investment, government expenditures, and then opening up to the rest of the economy the, 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 of the world. We have the, the net uh, net exports, which is the difference between exports by the U.S. and uh, imports by the U.S. or any other economy. So, demand aggregate demand, which we are going to note as Z, is equal to consumption plus investment, plus government expenditures, plus net exports. And the net exports is the difference between exports and imports. So this is domestic, this is external. Um, when we look at the data, we find that these, the, these uh, elements have different magnitudes. But by and large, in most economies, consumption constitutes the largest component. It's the largest component of aggregate demand. Investment is also important, but investment is especially important in terms of determining movements of, uh, of, of aggregate demand in the short run. It tends to be the most uh, volatile uh, component of, of aggregate demand. Therefore, we need to pay in, uh, attention to movements in investment as a way of understanding where the economy is heading. That's where you, 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 you hear when the when economic news comes, one of the things that people look at is changes in the, in the, in the housing market in terms of new constructions. If, there, there, if there's an increase in new constructions, that means that investment is, is increasing, the, the sentiments, uh, economic sentiments are, are, are improving, that is, that is likely to lead to higher growth. Also, we, look, we, pay, we pay attention to consumption, 
because an, an increase in consumption means that households are feeling uh, good about the economy. They are, they are seeing their incomes rising or expect their incomes to rise therefore they can afford to to increase uh, to increase consumption so the the movement in the in the private expenditures is going to be important in uh, in understanding where the economy is heading the way we understand consumption is that it's it's a result of a number of key factors one is income obviously the more income you have the more you can afford to consume um, but what you consume is your income is your net income uh, after having paid for taxes. Um, so consumption is typically viewed as a function of, of income. So there is a part of consumption which is not dependent on income. Even people who, are, who don't have income uh, um, are consuming, either because from, from savings um, the, from, from savings that they have accumulated in the, in the past or other, so, other non-income sources. But then the part that deten depends on income is this one where we're saying that consumption is a function of net income, income minus uh, taxes. And the, this co coefficient C1 is going to be very important in our analysis. We call it the marginal propensity to consume. So how, by how much does your consumption increase when you get an increase in income? And we believe that we, 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 we typically we see that this depends on the levels of income. People who are at the minimum consumption level are going to consume the bulk of, of the increase in, in income, whereas people in the higher income uh, category consume only a, fra a smaller fraction of the increase in income. Uh, so when we look at, when we want to understand now what is the equilibrium in the goods market? Equilibrium in the goods market is going to be determined by the, where income is equal to demand or output is equal to demand. This will be our condition for equilibrium in the, in the goods market. So output is used for consumption, investment, government expenditures, and some exported um, to the rest of the world. Now, that means that we can actually determine the conditions for equilibrium in the goods market. So for equilibrium in the goods market, the first we say that we can say that equilibrium is achieved when output is equal to demand. Now we know that demand uh, is the sum of consumption investment government expenditures and import my export minus uh, import but we also know that consumption is determined by disposable income net income plus then we add investment ex government expenditures import export minus imports so this is our condition for equilibrium in the goods market. We can then rewrite this to only have income on the left-hand side, so to see what, is the, what are the components of uh, the aggregate demand that determines actually uh, e uh, equilibrium in the, in the goods market. When we rewrite this, we can have it in the following form. Here we're going to leave out for the moment. For the moment, we're going to, to look only at domestic uh, demand. Leave out uh, exports and imports. 
So our equation is going to be simplified. This has been left out. What does, it, what do, what does this equation say? It says that <coughs> equilibrium, is, as, we, as we saw before, is, is when output is equal to aggregate demand. But we can see that there are, there are key parameters that are going to determine equilibrium in the, in, in, um, in the economy. One is dependent on the marginal propensity to consume, which is C1. But you can also see here some interesting uh, components. This is autonomous consumption, investment, government expenditures, and taxes. Let's focus on these two, government expenditures and taxes. These are the key elements of fiscal policy that the government can use to influence the economy. What this equation says is that when the government increases government expenditures, since this is uh, 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 additive, there's a positive sign here, that means that income output is going to increase. You can increase government expenditures to stimulate output. And that's what uh, generally m many times government, gov governments do. To stimulate the economy, they increase government expenditures. In contrast, you can see that if you increase taxes, when government increases taxes, because of this negative sign here, we will see that income dec declines. But the question is, by how much? By using this equation, we can see that if, if government increases government expenditures, the increase in, in income that results for, from that change is equal to the change in government expenditures divided by 1 minus C1. Now, because 1 minus C1 is what we call marginal propensity to consume, which is the fraction of income, you consume, of, of, of income that you consume if you get an increase in the income, we know that if you get an increase of $100, the maximum you can spend additionally is 100 So the marginal propensity to consume must be less than 1. OK, so that's very important. Now, since marginal propensity to consume is, is, is less than 1, that means that 1 over 1 minus C1 is greater than 1, which means that if government expenditures increase by $1, output is going to increase by more than $1. I repeat, if the government were to increase expenditures by $1, output in the economy would increase by more than $1. And you ask me why? One of the, reason, uh, the key reason is that when government increases expenditures, it's either building roads, building schools. That means that it's, it's, uh, it, it's giving an opportunity for people to earn income. That earned income is going to be spent. And the, sp the, the spending is going to give opportunities for firms to produce more, more, more goods and services, and so on and so on. So the, one, the initial $1 is going to produce more income. That's what we call the uh, income multiplier. Okay, so the government has an opportunity to stimulate the economy by increasing government expenditures. If the government increases taxes, we have a result which is uh, in the opposite direction. So an increase in government in taxes is going to reduce income. So if taxes increase, income is going to go down. And we see that the change in income is going to be equal to the change in taxes divided by 1 minus 1. Uh, oh, sorry, C, there's a C1 minus C1 divided by uh, 1 over minus C1. From this equation, you can see that the change in income is negative. You increase taxes, you reduce income. But it's less than the change in government ex in income that was due to the change in government expenditures. So the increase in income from increasing government expenditures is in absolute value 
larger than the decline in income due to the change in taxes by one dollar, which means that the government has a larger impact on the economy through, st through expenditures than the negative impact on, on the economy through uh, an increase in taxes. So um, these are two important uh, elements of fiscal policy that the government uses uh, on a regular basis to stimulate the economy, government expenditures, uh, the government will, will, will increase its, its expenditures, to slow down the economy, the government will reduce, will increase uh, taxation, for example, if they believe that the government, the economy is, is growing too fast. Um, so we can see here that we can actually, we have a way of quantifying the impact, the impact of fiscal policy on the economy. So the, to summarize, the equilibrium in the, in the goods market is determined by output equal to uh, aggregate demand, which is comprised of consumption by households, investment by, by firms, uh, expenditures by the government in the closed economy. We open the economy, we have to add exp uh, exports minus imports. We saw that once we get the equilibrium in the, in the goods market, we actually have a way of examining the impact of government expenditures uh, and, and taxes on the economy using the multiplier, which, which depends significantly on the marginal propensity to consume. Okay, so uh, we have